Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We turn humbly to God and we ask for guidance and help because He is the All Perfect One, because He is the All Merciful One, and because His mercy is endless. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina Muhammad wa alihi al-Tahirin. Elders, brothers, sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We were discussing about uh, Surah Waqi'ah, chapter 56. It has 96 verses. Uh, surah revealed in the pre-migration uh, period and uh, sequentially it is supposed to be the 44th surah between chapter 20 surah Taha and chapter 26 surah Shu'ara <coughs> Next. and uh, we said that in the riwayat there are several hadith about the importance of reciting this surah Number one, that uh, it protects you from uh, poverty. Man qara'a surat al-waqi'a lam tusibhu faqatun abadan. Wala afa. Wala faqr. Whosoever recites this is protected from poverty. Number two, the rewai says, Habbabahu, ahabbahu Allah, wa ahabbahu ila nas He becomes, he, he can gain popularity. Number three, you, um, enter into a state where you are constantly in the remembrance of God. Kutiba laysa min al-ghafilin Whosoever recites this surah. And number four, we are told that he will meet his Lord. Wa wajhuhu kal qamar laylat al-badr He shall be so spiritually uh, accomplished that he will be shining brilliantly. Metaphorical way of saying there will be spiritual uh, perfection. And uh, there is one riwayah which says if you want to know the description of uh, Jannah, then this is the surah to recite. مَنِ اشْتَاقَ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ وَصِفَتِهَا فَلْيَقْرَأْ سُورَةَ الْوَاقِعَةِ These are some of the merits and benefits for this surah. Next uh, slide, please. You'll have to... I'll just summarize this. You'll have to go on to the next... Next. <coughs> These 96 verses can be broken up into uh, sections. Uh, go down the whole. There are about seven sections. Um, the first section can be treated as an introduction, I number one to six. What is the event? And uh, when w it happens, what will be the changes that take place? Section two, when the changes do take place, what will be the end result? And then you shall be divided into three groups. Section three, then discusses the rewards for each of these three groups, the foremost, the good doers and the evil doers. So ayah number 11 to 26 describes seven different bounties to be given to the sabiqun, the foremost. Ayah number 27 to 40 describes seven blessings which shall be enjoyed by those who are good doers, the ashab al yameen or ashab al maymana. And ayah number 41 to 56, seven types of punishment that shall be suffered by the evil doers. I number 57 to 74 then moves away from description to now um, the explanation. What is the proof that Qiyamah must be there? So some of the same proofs that were mentioned in the earlier surah that we discussed are also mentioned here. Two proofs are mentioned there. Here seven proofs are mentioned. The fact that he is the creator, the fact that he is the uh, sustainer whereby the sperm is enabled to develop to a fully human being, the fact that he sends water, fire, the fact that this cannot be without purpose. Seven different proofs are mentioned in the fourth section. Fifth section, the discussion shifts away from Qiyamah to that of uh, Quran and the importance of the Quran. Fala 
that this is a holy Quran. It is hidden, it's inaccessible, but some people can access it. Those who are purified. <coughs> the last section, ayah number 83 to ayah number 96, then describes the end result. The scenario where a person is dying and his friends and family are gathered around and nobody can save the process of separation of the soul from the body and then the final end result of these three groups the muqarrabin the the foremost the good doers ashabul yameen and what will happen to the wicked ones ashabul shimal that's the outline of the surah next slide please we've discussed ayah number one to six in the previous session very briefly Remember the time when the event shall take place, which is inevitable, which is unavoidable, which is so important that one of the best descriptions, and it's unavoidable, one of the best descriptions of it is, it is the event, the most important event that is going to decide the eternal future of man is this event. And that's how important it is. Next slide, please. لَيْسَ لِوَقَعَتِهَا كَاذِبَا There is no denying, there is no untruth in its reporting. When it shall happen, it shall be so pervasive, everywhere you look you'll find the evidence for its truthfulness. There is no untruth in that. Next slide please. خَافِضَةٍ رَافِعَةٍ when it does happen, two things, immediate effects will be, some who are low will be raised, some who are high will be lowered. The standards of highness and lowness are all going to change at that time. Next slide, please. <laughs> but as the event unfolds, there will be cataclysmic, apocalyptic changes throughout the universe. But this surah concentrates on the changes that will take place on the earth. Either when it will be shaken violently, the earth. And the mountains shall be crumbled and they'll convert into dust. And we discussed last time the different changes that will happen to the mountains. One, they'll be lifted. Two, they'll be moved. Three, they'll be crush, crashed. Four, they'll crumble. Five, they'll become like dust. Six, they'll become like wool. Seven, they'll be just like a mirage. وَسُيِّرَةِ الْجِبَالُ فَكَانَتْ sarabah. You think you're looking at a mountain. Actually, it's not a mountain. It's gone. It's finished. The solidity and the firmness, it's disappeared. Next slide, please. Um, we discussed this also. Where are the potential points where these changes can take place on a global scale? Next slide. All right, we've discussed this. Next. وَكُنْتُمْ أَزْوَاجًا ثَلَاثًا When all these changes on a global scale shall happen, the end result will be that you shall be divided into three groups. In the Quran elsewhere, uh, there is mention of different groupings. For example, as far as the jinn are concerned, in Surah Jinn, chapter 72, ayah number 14, Allah says, amongst the jinn, there are not three groups. There are two groups. Those who are good and those who are bad. Those who are believers and those who are disbelievers. وَأَنَّ مِنَّ الْمُسْلِمُونَ وَمِنَّ الْقَاسِطُونَ From amongst us, there are those who have submitted themselves to the truth when we heard it. When the Quran was recited, there were some jinn who came and listened to it. The beginning of this surah is قُلْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ إِسْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنْ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا The jinn came and listened. The jinn were intelligent enough to be able to understand. The jinn were responsive enough to be able to submit. The jinn were um, endowed with a capability to be amazed at a message. In Nastama'ana Quranan, something recited, Ajaba. It's wonderful, we've never heard anything like this before. In response, Anna min al Muslimun, some submit to the truth, wa min al qasitun, qasta is when you deviate away from the truth, when you go away from 
uh, justice. So there are those the wicked and those who are good. Amongst the angels, all of them are good. Ibadun mukramun la yasbiquna lahu bil qawl wa hum bi amrihi ya'malun. They are totally subservient and submissive to the will of their Lord. Angels are all good. But it's amongst the humans that you have three potential groups. This division into three is also mentioned in Surah Fatir, chapter 35, ayah number 32, where when the message is brought to the people, the response of those people is then divided into three groups. There are those who are foremost in doing good, number one. There are, number two, there are those who are average. And number three, there are those who are wicked. There's some amongst our servants who are totally submissive to our will. We, as they, as they gain spiritual perfection, we then select them to be the leaders. And once they become the leaders, we reveal the book to them. And then they bring this law and guidance and moral advice to mankind. فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ Once they leave this legacy behind and they go away, this law, this scripture, this book, there are those who do not follow this book. They know the truth of it, but they are disobedient. وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدِ There are some who are average. They accept part, they reject the others, they do some good, they do some evil. They are sinners, but they are believers. وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ Bilkhayrat, but amongst the followers are those who are the foremost in doing good. They don't commit any evil. The same categorization into three groups appears in this surah also. Wakuntum azwajan thalatha. Next slide, please. Fa ashabul maymana ma ashabul maymana. Group number one are those who are the people of the right hand. People of the right hand, reason why they've been labeled so could be one, because they're given their book of deeds in their right hand on the day of judgment. In some surahs they're mentioned. For example, in surah in Shiqaq, Allah says, فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا يَسِيرًا وَيَنْقَلِبُ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ مَسْرُورًا there are those who shall be given their books in their right hands as a matter as a matter of honor, as a matter of respect, as a matter of acknowledgement and recognition that these people were always righteous. Right hand symbolic of being righteous. Right hand symbolic of being honored. The consequence there, the result of action here. Another reason why they, they're called the people of the right hand is perhaps because they shall be ushered into heaven by their right hand. Again, a, 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 man, a manner of respect to them. Or no, maimana could mean not only uh, yameen as right, maimana could be from the word yuman, which means baraka. We say yawmul jumu'ah is yawmul mubarakun maimun. It's full of baraka. Um, <laughs> there's a riwayah, it's interesting. It says that uh, a mu'min, both his hands are right. Kilta yadayil mu'min yameen. Both the hands of a mu'min are right. Right in the sense they're full of baraka. Whatever he does is full of baraka. In contrast, both the hands of the disbeliever, disbeliever here meaning the one who has been shown the truth, A, who has understood it, B, and then refuses to accept it, C, and then defiantly opposes it, D, both his hands are left, meaning that he is wicked, he is evil. That is one group. How do we identify and explain to you who they are? Well, we label them as the people of the right hand, the righteous, the blessed ones, the one who all do everything good. They think good, they feel good, they act good. Well, uh, can you give us a little more description about those people? Ma ashabul maymana. Oh, what can we tell you about these people? They are beyond praise. They are beyond description. Fa ashabul maymana. The people of the right hand who are righteous and blessed. 
Oh, so, so what about them? Can you tell me something more? Asma ashabul maymana. What can I tell you about them? They've achieved a lot of good. Enough for their description is this, that they're people of the right hand. <coughs> Next uh, slide. وَأَصْحَابُ الْمَشْأَمَ مَا أَصْحَابُ الْمَشْأَمَ The second group. There are those who shall be given their book of deeds in their left hand. Um, the people of the left hand, for example in Surah in Shiqaq, again, they've been described as those who shall be given their books behind their backs. وَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ وَرَاءَ ظَهْرِهِ فَسَوْفَ يَدْعُوا ثُبُورًا وَيَصْلَى سَعِيرًا there are some who shall be given their book of records, their whole life shall be presented to them and they shall become aware of it. The manner in which they shall be presented with it will be in a degrading way because they degraded the truth. Now the whole system of the universe is responding back in a degrading way and from their left, from their back they shall be given this record. Or no, they're called the people of the left hand metaphorically to indicate that they shall be led in a disrespectful way to the Jahannam. Or no, mash'ama could be derived from the word opposite to yuman, which is shu'um. Shu'um means something which is mash'um, which has misfortune or inauspicious. People who are therefore going to be afflicted with misfortune as a result of their evil deeds. These are the people of the left hand. <coughs> so what about them? Can you tell me something more about them? The evil, the affliction, the misfortune that they're going to suffer is so great. It's difficult to describe. What can make you know the, um, the degradation, the deprivation of these people of the left hand? Next slide, please. And then the last group, the third one, was Sabiqoon. And those were the foremost. <coughs> well, uh, can you tell us a little more about these Sabiqoon, the foremost? No. A Sabiqoon, you know what about them? They are the Sabiqoon, they are the foremost. <coughs> they were the foremost in following the prophets. Therefore, they're going to be the foremost in receiving the rewards. They were the foremost in obedience. Therefore, they're going to be the foremost in receiving mercy. They were the foremost in uh, going towards virtue. In fact, they became leaders for others. And therefore, they are the foremost in attaining the highest blessings God will give them in the day of uh, judgment. <coughs> they were the ones who were the foremost towards everything that's good. Towards faith, towards jihad, towards sadaqah. Towards Salah, incidentally there is a riwayah which says that Sabiqoon here refers to those people who are the foremost in going towards prayers. Prayer as the epitome uh, which symbolizes all that is good. Hayya ala khayr al-amal. To the extent that I want to discover, do I, can I belong to this group? The test is when, when the time for Salah comes, if I do hear the Adhan, what is my response? Even if I don't hear the Adhan, what is my response? That will determine to what extent spiritually I am under the Sabiqoon or not. <coughs> In the Quran, there is uh, praise for such people who are the uh, Sabiqoon. So, in Surah Hadid, for example, chapter 57, those people who strive to do virtue before others, they're praised. So for example, ayah number 10 of Surah Hadid, chapter 57. Why don't you spend in the way of God of what Allah has given you extra? Don't fear that you shall lose what you're giving away. In fact, Allah will replace it. In fact, Allah will double what you give away. And then, even amongst those who do spend, Allah makes a distinction. لا يستوي منكم من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل أولئك أعظم درجة من الذين أنفقوا من بعد وقاتلوا. 
those people <clears throat> who sacrificed, who spent in the way of God, defending the cause of God, before the final victory, when hordes, when large numbers of people then entered Islam, those who in difficult times sacrificed, definitely they're much better than those who begin to sacrifice and to support the cause after victory. Of course, both of them shall be rewarded, but Allah acknowledges the extra effort made by one group over the other. Wallahu bima ta'amaluna khabir. To be foremost in doing something definitely is recognized by Allah. This is one example. And there are other examples. In Surah Tawbah, for example, this whole group of those who are the foremost in believing are praised. Those people who were the first ones to accept the truth. They're different from others. When the message was first declared, a single man comes. He claims he's the prophet. He's brought the message of the truth. The general response, either silence or rejection. One, two, three, begin to say yes. Definitely these first people who listen, everybody has listened, but the first people who understand and who respond by accepting, and despite all the pressures of potential persecution and rejection of established customs, they go ahead and, and declare their faith, they proclaim their faith, definitely they're much better. They're the And as you find in every community, from all the past prophets till, till the last prophet, there will always be, always be a group of people who are the foremost. So we are told uh, amongst the sons of Adam, Habil is the Sabiqun. Amongst the followers, amongst the Ummat of Musa, we are told that the Mu'min of Ali Fir'aun was the Sabiqun. In the Ummat of Isa alayhi salam, Habib Najjar was the Sabiqun. وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَ الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى and he came to the people, he says, uh, listen to me, I have, I, I have a message to deliver. This is my impression of what these prophets are saying. <laughs> in the ummah of the last prophet, definitely there will be those who are the first and foremost in listening, in responding, and in accepting, and in proclaiming their faith. After, amongst the Arabs, obviously you'll find the first ones. The Rewaih says Ali alayhi salam was the first one. Amongst the uh, Persians, when they got to know about Islam, there's obviously going to be someone who is first uh, compared to everybody else, Salman al-Farsi. Amongst the Romans, we are told, there's one who is the foremost, Suhaib al-Rumi. Amongst the Habash from uh, Black Africa, also there will be someone who will be the foremost, Bilal al-Habashi. Amongst the Nubians, the Nabat, uh, we are told that <coughs> Khabab was the first one who... Uh, uh, who proclaimed faith and extrapolate this this guidance? You go to every community <laughs> amongst the, the the sorry <laughs> amongst the Kojas, amongst the every tribe you can imagine. The the test is always there. Who is there to whom the message reaches equally, and he's the first to respond and to proclaim. <clears throat> They've got a merit over others. Why? Well, because uh, first of all, you are intelligent enough to understand. Two, you're bold enough to say yes, despite all the social pressures that you will face. One of the biggest, biggest challenges the cause of truth faces is the silent majority. The majority who know the truth, but are not bold enough to stand up for it. And therefore, the sabiqun definitely are uh, occupy a meritorious position and not only the companions of the Prophet the companions of every Imam and righteous leader and successor to the Prophet will obviously have the Sabiqun and you look at the Rewayat, you look at history and you'll find names for every period and for every Imam and so also for the 12th Imam you shall find 313 Sabiquna in al Khayrat question what do I need to do to become that? Inshallah, we'll discuss that uh, later. Next. Uh, so this is the example I was just mentioning. Next slide, please. Ula'ikal muqarrabun. 
one description is enough and that is they are the ones who are near to God God the all perfect one and therefore they are the highest in perfection how do they achieve that perfection by obedience next slide please beginning from this ayah onwards now we get the description of the seven bounties and blessings that shall be given to these people fee as 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 an um, opening uh, statement fi jannatin naim they shall be uh, sent to gardens not a single one gardens multiple multiple not of the same levels obviously multiple at different levels degrees of proximity fi jannatin naim you can also have gardens here the difference between the garden here and the garden there is the pleasures there are naim. First of all, they're plentiful. Two, they're permanent. Three, they're profound. None of these three features we have in gardens here. Any place you can imagine here that can give you comfort and pleasure and bliss has got these three big problems. A, the pleasures are not plentiful. They're limited after all. B, they're not permanent. <laughs> How much can you eat? They will re you will reach a stage where you're sated. Once you're sated, you bring the best of food and mo the most delicious, you won't be able, you don't even have the interest to eat anymore. Even if you want to eat, you become sick. And three, not only is it plentiful, not only is it uh, permanent, it's profound. The degree of pleasure we experience here is superficial. The degree of pleasure we shall experience there is deep and sustained and intense. Fi jannatin na'im. They shall be near the Lord, yes, but they shall also enjoy the physical pleasures. To be near God, angels are near God, but they don't have a bodily existence. Their pleasure or their fear is more mental, cognitive, spiritual. The muqarrabun, because man is made up of the soul and the body, he shall have spiritual pleasure, yes, but also, also, they shall have physical pleasures. Next slide, please. Before the uh, seven uh, physical pleasures are described, um, numbers are mentioned. ثُلَّةٌ مِّنَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنَ الْآخِرِينَ These سَابِقُونَ, uh, these مُقَرَّبُونَ, they are more from the past communities, less from this community. Why? Usually, those who are the foremost are the prophets themselves. One and two, the successes of the prophet, and three, perhaps the closest companions to these uh, successes of the prophet. And there are obviously very few people. And because the past prophets were many, the Quran doesn't give numbers. The riwayah says it's 1,24,000. The riwayah, so the ayah in the Quran says, there's not a single nation of people, a community of people in any part of the world but that Allah has sent a prophet to them. We've sent to every community a prophet. Surah Nahl. In khala min umma illa nadhir. There is not an ummah which is khali, which is uh, devoid of a messenger. There's no need to mention hundreds of thousands of names. The general principle is this. There is not a community, but that Allah will send a prophet to them. Therefore, they will be those who will be foremost in responding to them. Because the numbers of the past prophets is huge, one indicator is 124,000, definitely those will be foremost in responding to them. The successors included will be much greater than the last prophet and his 12 successors. So in one sense, the numbers are more there because the prophets are more there. However, there are some riwayat which indicate that um, every imam has his own uh, foremost companions. So the fifth old imam, for example, says, نَحْنُ السَّابِقُونَ وَنَحْنُ الْآخِرُونَ We're not awalun. We're the last uh, community. Or the sixth old imam says uh, to those who have followed the Ahlul Bayt's message, Antumu sabiqun You are the ones who are the foremost. Al awwaluna wal akhirun. You are the foremost, both in the early times and both in the latter times also. Uh, next slide. Now, uh, there's a description of the seven blessings, but before I go into that, just one note. Practically speaking, it's very important, this question of being the foremost. Um, 
You notice when we go for uh, Umrah or for, for Hajj, we go to Medina, there's some places we're supposed to visit. One of the places is Masjid Quba. Masjid Quba, the Riwaya says, whosoever visits the Masjid, uh, the Thawab is, and prays two rak'ah there, and the Prophet used to go there and pray even when he was in Medina. You get the Thawab of making one Umrah. Now, when Allah promises a reward for something, there must be a reason. Allah doesn't give rewards without reason. He's all wise. If there is a reward, there must be some purpose. Because He's all perfect, therefore there must be something happening in us when we go there and pray that is perfect and therefore enables us to get the thawab. Question what? There was uh, one uh, scholar I met on one occasion, one trip, and I asked him, uh, what do you think would be the reason there's emphasis on coming to visit the uh, Masjid Quba and praying to Raqqa there? And he answered that perhaps it's this issue of being foremost. Perhaps it's this issue of being first. Quba is the first mosque which was established outside Mecca, outside Medina. Kaaba is in awwala baytin wudi'a lil nas lalladhi bi bakkata mubarakan wa hudan But outside Medina, the first mosque is Quba la masjidun ussisa This ayah is inscribed there in that mosque la masjidun ussisa ala taqwa min awwali yawmin ahakku an taquma fihi فِيهِ رِجَالٌ يُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَتَطَهَّرُوا وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُطَّهِّرِينَ The mosque that was the first to be built on the principle and foundation of taqwa. And it is a mosque in which people who attend are those who are eager to seek purity, purity of the mind, purity of the heart, purity in their deeds. This mosque is definitely superior to other mosques. There's another mosque mentioned which is uh, the Masjid Dirar. So, Sabiqun is so important <coughs> to be foremost, to be the first in responding to the truth. <coughs> that the first mosque is being praised. The bounties promised by for, for these people, <coughs> I've just mentioned them uh, uh, one is couches, reclining, uh, reclining couches. Uh, incidentally, the word uh, sofa for a couch is derived from the Arabic, sofa. Sofa. This couch, there's an upholstery. The upholstery is being stuffed with uh, soft uh, material to give you comfort when you rest. The material that is stuffed in is sofa, and this gradually became to be known as the sofa. The couch, one. Two, you shall be served by servants. Three, you shall be given wine, but a special type of wine, of course. <laughs> the heavenly wine. Four, the, the food that will be served, first will be fruits, and then will be the main meal, the meat. Five. And six, you'll have partners. And seven, there'll be that spiritual calm and peace all around. Let's look at each, each of these uh, descriptions a little more in detail. Next slide, please. Ala sururin mawduna. They shall be reclining on this sofa, on this couch, which is mawduna. Mawduna can have one of two meanings. Either it's stuffed with gold and pearls, very precious, very attractive, very comforting. Aw mawduna could be describing not the uh, the product itself but the positioning. Because in the next ayah, next, uh, next slide, the next ayah says the positioning is such that muttaki'ina alayha mutaqabileen they shall be seated on these couches in a reclining, relaxed position with comfort <coughs> um, but they shall be facing each other. Already you notice uh, in, in a gathering like this, you can only have two groups facing each other. But if there were to be a third row, they're going to give you a backs. Already here you're facing that problem. But there's a unique situation there where the couches positioning, they shall be facing each other. It's interesting, this description of couch is one, and they're positioning in such a way that you face each other too. And then most important, 
the atmosphere of uh, relaxed companionship is repeated again and again in the uh, Quran. It seems it's a very important uh, blessing to be brothers, to be friendly, and to be open. Why face each other? Look at this uh, ayah uh, which describes that in Surah Hajr, chapter 15, ayah number 45 onwards. Those who are pious, they shall be in the gardens of bliss. Streams shall be flowing. Come and you're welcome. وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِلٍ إِخْوَانًا عَلَى سُرُورٍ متقابلين. And we shall extract, it will be difficult, but we shall forcibly extract any rancor, hostility, enmity, dislike that is there between the brothers. لَا يَمَسُّهُمْ فِيهَا نَصَبَّ وَلَا هُمْ It shall be permanent, they shall have no fatigue there, they'll be energized continuously. But they shall be reclining on couches facing each other in a brotherly atmosphere such that there shall be no hostility, there will be no hasad. We can be brothers, we are ready to help in some situations, but then you may be a little better than me in some areas, I may be a little better than you in some other areas. And if we don't have a complete degree of faith and therefore submission to the decree of God and in the justice and wisdom in his distribution of his gifts to the creation, there will always be a sense of dislike, jealousy, envy. Envy gradually builds up to enmity. Enmity then ends up in backbiting and trying to compete and trying to uh, thwart the interests of my brother. In that atmosphere, how, do, how to best describe a spirit of brotherhood which is open, which is frank, which is honest? That's the description. Reclining on couches, facing each other. Um, <laughs> one of the Mufassirin raises the question, all right? So they're going to be companions, they're going to be facing each other. What are they going to discuss? Uh, we don't know. The ayah is silent. There are other verses in the Quran which do talk, do talk about the dialogue that will take place between the, the people of uh, heaven and the people of hell. The dialogue that will take, take place between uh, the people of heaven themselves. They'll be thanking God and praising God. But then, because these people are perfect, because they, they are people who are pure, and because they are people who are now in full realization of God's total manifestation of his bliss and of his grace, definitely they shall be discussing the multiple ways in which God has manifested his blessings, the different names of God, the history of the dunya, what happened and what went wrong, the difficulties they had and how they have been uh, saved from that. Perhaps these would be some of the topics they would be discussing. Next slide, please. Bounty number two. يَطُوفُ عَلَيْهِمْ Wildanun Mukhalladun they shall be served tawaf yatufu they will be tawaf constantly in their service shall be wildan youths who will be immortal they shall not they shall not age they shall not weaken they shall be energetic always in service always handsome always presentable they shall not suffer disease or deficiency or death who are these Wildan? Mufassirin have offered different interpretations. Some say the Wildan are the children of Mu'mineen. Laysa lahum hasanat fayuthabu wa la sayyiat fayuaqabu. They have not done any good to be given a reward. They have not done any evil to be punished. So they shall be taken into service. That's one interpretation. But then others are saying no. But then after all, they are the children of the believers and they will follow their parents. And therefore, most probably these will, that will not be the children of Mu'mineen. Perhaps they'll be the children of the Mushrikeen. Atfalul Mushrikeen, the riwayah says, Khadamu Ahlul Jannah. The Khadim in the Jannah is the child of a disbeliever. The parent is accountable. He was mature, he rejected the truth. But the child is innocent. <laughs> or no, if even uh, the children of the Mushrikeen, 
uh, cannot be taken as these immortal youths, then Allah will specifically create uh, servants who will be immortal to serve. Next slide, please. The third uh, bounty. بِأَكْوَابٍ وَأَبَارِيقًا وَكَأْسٍ مِنْ مَعِينٍ Number three. They shall be reclining. One, they shall be served. Two, now the service. Three. The service, the first service will be wine. And you shall be served in these three types of vessels. The goblet, the ewer, and the cup. Goblet is um, something with a handle and a wide bowl shape on top. It's a description of a type of a vessel. Abariq is the plural of Ibriq. The Swahili say Birika. You'll have a handle and a spout. The vessel. And uh, <coughs> Ka'as is a cup which is filled. Ma'in is one which is clear to the eyes from Ma'in. And one which has, uh, which is flowing. And one which when you drink shall energize you. Next slide please. لا يصدعون عنها ولا ينزفون لكني this wine, this heavenly wine that shall be served will not be like the uh, earthly wine which has the after uh, effects of giving you headaches or which has the effect even if you don't drink in amounts that give you headaches um, to intoxicate you <coughs> again the description is withheld. What exactly will happen? When you reach a point where you want to describe something, what you say, it is so great, so great. Oh, but what do you mean it's great? I mean, the only wine I've seen is the one in dunya. No, 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 it's not the dunya one. It's not the, uh, the one which will give you a headache. It's not the one that will intoxicate you. It's so pure a drink that it will give you the pleasure, which in the other verses in Allah says, ma la aynun ra'at, the Riwayah says, what eyes have never seen, ولا أذن سمعت what ears have never heard ولا خطر على uh, and what has never crossed the mind it's beyond imagination so here is a description of a particular type of drink that shall be provided <coughs> but what is uh, what is negated are the deficient negative limiting qualities in the dunya <laughs> Next slide, please. Bounty number four. وَفَاكِهَةٍ مِمَّا يَتَخَيَّرُونَ After the drinks, the food will be served. But before the main dish, fruits will be served first. And مِمَّا uh, يَتَخَيَّرُونَ They'll be given a choice. وَمِنْ كُلِّ فَاكِهَةٍ زَوْجَانٍ فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانٍ And of all different types of fruits, there shall be pears. Uh, fruits that may be uh, applied to the summer season and they're available in the winter season. Fruits that are available which are sweet, highly or moderately sweet. Fruits that are in different colors. Different varieties. مِمَّا يَتَخَيَّرُونَ Next slide, please. وَلَحْمِ طَيْرٍ مِمَّا يَشْتَهُونَ and then the main dish. <laughs> There's a riwayah which says that Sayyid al Ta'am fi dunya wal akhirah al lahm. Meat is the best of the dishes, the best of the food. But the foul meat, and amongst the meat it seems the bird's meat is more delicious. Amongst the. <laughs> Amongst the, 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 the meat that shall be available, whenever the person wishes, yashtahun, he desires it, in a flash, it will appear in flesh and cooked and ready to be consumed. Next slide, please. Number six, wahurun ain, and there shall be partners who are pure and perfect partners. The description given in the Quran is they shall be hur, the huris. I would like to draw your attention that this doesn't specifically refer to female partners only. The word hur is the plural of hawra, the one who um, has a stark contrast between white and black, which enhances the beauty, therefore. 
And Hur is also the plural of Ahwar, the masculine. Ain is the plural of Aina, the female, big eyed. Again, as, uh, as a display of beauty. And also Ayan, the masculine. So Hur and Ain could refer to both partners that shall be given to male believers and partners that shall be given to the female believers also. <coughs> There was, uh, I couldn't get this, there was a, a study done in, in uh, psychology whereby students were given uh, pictures, different pictures of uh, handsome or pretty looking males and females and then uh, a composite picture then was made from the majority who selected a certain figure and a composite computer design figure was created. Unfortunately I couldn't get that uh, figure. <laughs> I guess different communities would develop different sensitivities and appreciation for different types of beauty. What is more important to realize is this. The Jannah is a process of uh, purification whereby that spiritual beauty is going to appear in the physical form. Their beauty is not skin deep, it's the other way around. It's the inner beauty that shall expose itself outside. This ayah in Surah Yasin keeps on telling us, On that day your mouth shall not speak. It's not your outward appearance that shall display your grade. It's your inner beauty that shall come out, that will display your status. Because that place is a place of purity and perfection, that inner true beauty and grace shall express itself in a physical form. Well, how do you describe to people what is the highest beauty form? We take generally if, if what attracts their attention is a big-eyed or a one, one in which there is this contrast. So this is an example of what is truly beautiful. <laughs> Next slide, please. And if you're looking for partners who are faithful and partners who, uh, who have been untouched, just like pearls which are guarded, guarded from strangers' eyes, she, she or he has been unseen by anyone with lustful eyes. She or he is someone who has been untouched by anyone. Again, something to enhance the attraction of these partners. Next slide, please. All these six bounties that have been mentioned, they're all a reward for what they had been striving for and struggling for. Allah will not give anything for free. It's the result of what they have done. It's the struggle, the jihad, mental jihad, emotional jihad, spiritual jihad, the sacrifice that they made. The result of that is now these different bounties that they shall be given. Bima kanu ya'malun. They used to constantly do it. Not occasionally do good and then go back to evil. No. Constantly they would be striving to do good. Next slide please. And then the final reward, the seventh one. La yasma'una fiha laghwan wa la ta'theema. The environment, the, the spiritual environment will be so pure that there shall be no lies, no false accusations, no rumors, no suspicions, no allegations, therefore no backbiting, therefore no insult. Uh, uh, so that will be no sinful speech and no vain talk, even if the talk is mubah. But if it's frivolous and vain and meaningless, even that will be avoided. Why? Because these people are wise people. These are perfected people. They, they are impressed by the overwhelming beauty they see. They cannot therefore be preoccupied with lower uh, mundane uh, issues. It's impossible for them to engage the, in that lower level now. They wouldn't have been allowed access to Jannah if they were still at that low level. Therefore, every spoken word or every heard word will be something which is useful and friendly and loving and respectful and courteous. Illa qila salaman salama.
What they shall hear, of course, is nothing but peace and blessings. <coughs> peace and blessings from whom? One is from God. Salam qawlam min rabbin rahim. Salam from whom? Salam from, from angels. Alladheena titawafahum wal malaika tayyabeen qalu salam. Those whose souls shall be taken by the angels and who are good doers in the dunya, they shall be greeted with salam. Udkhuluha bi salamin aminin. There will be salam from each other. Salam again, as an expression of the feelings of peace and brotherhood and the desire of goodwill, honest, earnest goodwill towards each other. Let's pray to Allah to get the tawfiq to be able to strive to attain this uh, status. Inshallah, I'll discuss that in the next session. What are the actions that we can take to try to achieve to attain this uh, status, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.